Why don't we begin our, our uh, message tonight? Because God is good and his word needs to speak to us. But before we do that, let uh, please join me in a word of prayer as I hide myself behind the cross. Father, I want to thank you so much that only you, Lord, can be the potter. And only you know how to shape us and fashion us. And Lord, I thank you so much that you're so gentle with us. You're so kind with us. Lord, there's so many rough people in the world when we just need to be loved. And it's so nice that we can be in your hands, and you only move at a pace that we can grow and not grow weary. So please bless us tonight through your word, and I always ask that you just hide me behind the cross. May your word be heard. May Jesus be seen. For the honor and glory of his namesake is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Saturday night, what did we talk about? Jesus is the way out. That's right. Jesus is the way out. Who made the world? Jesus did. We saw in Scripture that it was Jesus who made the world. Not only did he make the world, but he, re he created our first parents, Adam and Eve. And when Adam and Eve sinned, disobeyed God on just that one simple command, who called for Adam? It was Jesus, right? 
Jesus called for Adam, and what was the first result of sin? Breakdown of relationship between he and God, he and his wife, and of course the serpent wasn't interested in relationships. But Jesus took away the fear from Adam and Eve. Isn't that true? Gave them an opportunity to come out and tell them what they did wrong. And he came and he clothed them with animal skins, a lamb most likely symbolically showing that in the future he would cover us with his own righteousness and remove our fear of the past, fear of the present, and fear of the judgment, which we are going to talk about in the nights coming up. So Jesus indeed is the way out, right? And we also learn that God hates fear. God does not want us to live in fear because the Bible clearly says in Hebrews 2, 13, and 14, that is the devil who had the power of death by which Jesus killed that power by dying on the cross, right? And it was Jesus' mission, according to Hebrews, to remove fear from our lives because we were kept in bondage to fear, right? So Jesus obviously is the way out. Are you happy about that tonight? Amen. Then we talked last night about the book that breathes. Once again, it's all about Jesus. Jesus made the world into existence by his spoken word. Then he becomes the incarnate word of God in the flesh to live among us, right? Tabernacle among us. Live among you and live among me so that he can know our pain and know our sorrows. He dies on the cross, and every single act of his life, we specifically looked at the book of John, was words of spoken word that created power and healing in the lives of many. So not only was Jesus the word before and created the universe by his word, but he became the word, and then after becoming the word, he still spoke the word and transformed everyone's life. And that very word was recorded by men and women of old that the Bible says, we're moved by the Holy Spirit, correct? The Bible says all scripture, some, no, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. In other words, scripture, this book and only this book, is God breathed. And that is a beautiful thing because it means if you have the word of God, you can have Jesus, correct? Amen. Tonight's topic is agent of change, right? How many of us are afraid of change? Would you not agree? Sure, we don't like to change. We like to stay comfortable. We like to be happy. We like to get all of our ducks in a row and know exactly what's expected and try to carve out our little niche in life and find our comfort zone. We don't like change, right? No, we don't, not often. But how many of you like to get something new now and then? Raise your hands. I'm kind of an interactive guy. I like to see a show of hands. That's right. Everybody here, even if you didn't raise your hand, come on. We like to get something new now and then. Isn't that correct? Ladies, would you like to get a new a dish set. Sure you would, of course, right? New wardrobe, new carpet, new house, right? Guys, anybody in here like tools? I'm kind of, a, I like to work on cars when I can, don't have a lot of time, but any, any workers on cars, mechanics in here? I'm the only one. No, right, all right, good, I'm a good company. Okay, guys like tools, so wouldn't you like to have a nice big snap-on set? I don't know if they sell those in England, but just a nice, shiny new tool set with everything, box wrenches, open end wrenches, you know, you name it, screwdrivers, Allen wrenches. Absolutely, guys love tools. They like to tinker on things. Fine, maybe you're not into tools, guys. How many of you would like to have a new car? Yeah? All right. Any car? <laughs> Doesn't even have to be new, right? I'll take any car. To you teenagers out there, if we have any teenagers out there. You know, so we like, we like new stuff. Um, it's just human nature, human nature because while we don't like to change so much and get out of our comfort zone, we do like the newness in things. Now, just south of us from Bakersfield, California, is the one and only Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles, right? And just outside the city of Los Angeles is the one and only Beverly Hills, right, dear? That's true. Home of so many movie stars, quote unquote, right? Beverly Hills. And when you drive through Beverly Hills, and we've done this a few times, you would quickly notice that both car and driver appear as though they just rolled off the assembly line, right? Car shiny, not a single bug on the windshield, hair in perfect place, right? Tie nice and crisp, and they're just rolling down the road. Like they just came off the assembly line. It looks brand new, right? We like the new, and that kind of characterizes Beverly Hills. Like we don't know how they do it, but it just seems like everything in Beverly Hills right out of the factory. Now, I know you Londoners like antiques. Anybody in here like antiques? Come on, let's be honest. All right, okay, sure. So, so antiques aren't new, right? But you can get an antique 
and replace something else, and it's new to you. True? That's right. You could get a new dresser. You could get a new wardrobe, or not, you new, a new bureau. You could get a new night table. You could get a new lampstand. Antiques are really cool. And it's obvious when you walk around the city that London is a place that, while it is trying to modernize, ever trying to modernize, it still likes the old, right? So it's new for us being here. It's not new for you, but it's new for us. We like the new. It may not even be an item. It could actually be a location. How many of you would like to move to someplace new, right? All right, sure, we like new. We like new, and so whether it's new that or new there, we like new. The truth is, however, that so many people wake up every single day, right? They go to the mirror, they get every little hair perfectly in place, whether you're a lady or a guy, because you know even us guys got to have the hair in the place. I mean, I kind of have a messy haircut sometimes, but I'm getting more neater as I get older. You know, we like to have everything in place. And the ladies put on their makeup ever so perfectly, and the guys straighten up, sorry, straighten up, and they're looking in the mirror, and everything's just perfect, right? I mean, that's what we do to ourselves when we wake up. If you care at all, you're, nobody just gets out of the bed and just goes straight into town. So that's what we do. But how many people get in front of the mirror, and they look at themselves in the mirror, and they're smiling, and they think, I'm looking pretty good. And then all of a sudden they say, I need a new life. Am I right? Millions of people each and every day wake up, do all they can to look their best, get in front of the mirror, and they stare at themselves for a moment, and for the moment they feel great until that moment passes, and they say, I need a new life. And new life sounds great, does it not? Now, no sooner do we say that, or you have said that, when the world is ready to answer. Am I right? Now, what do you guys call, and ladies call, billboards in London? Is it billing boards, or do you use billboards? Is that right? OK, I, I tried to figure it out online so I could try to get the terminology right. So billboards works, and we're going to call it billboards. All right. No sooner do you say, I need a new life, when you're driving down the road, and there's the billboard, right? Come into our department store, and you can have a new you, right? How many of you have been up late watching those infomercials? Get these vitamins, and they're going to transform your life and make you brand new. Act now, and we'll give you five more. If you call in the next 10 minutes, we'll give you 15, right? And then, of course, you call, and you find out that the shipping and handling is about $90 or 90 pounds. You know, so the world is so good at promising new. Am I correct? And no sooner do we read those ads, those billboards, and we find ourselves in the car lot. We find ourselves in the department store. We find ourselves in the supermarket. We find ourselves trying to figure out how to make the newness a part of our own lives. And it works, doesn't it? The advertising works. Because the truth is, once we've bought into the advertising and we actually get the product or the place, we quickly find out something that the new doesn't really last that long. Am I right? Sometimes the things the world gives us, in fact, I would say most of the time, the newness doesn't last that long. It only lasts for a season. I'll tell you, you know what? Dear, isn't it true that sometimes when we go through the grocery line, you ever go through the grocery line, those of you who have kids, and you know, you're there and they always put all those little trinkets right, right next to the, to the register so that as you're standing in line waiting for the person in front of you to hurry up so that your kids don't notice what's there on the counter, right? You're, you feel the tug on the, on the pants. Mommy, 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 get me this, get me that. And usually we just say, no, 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 no. You know, that's just junk. But every once in a while we're feeling bad or we've been in the supermarket too long and we've just, our patience has been worn thin, right? And we get them that little trinket and, trinket, and they think it's just the greatest thing in the world. It's brand new, right? Now, how long does the joy of that thing last? Yeah, you know. You get home, they pop the pack package open, and it lasts about five minutes. And the next thing you know, they're fighting and arguing, and they're right back to the same old, same old, right? Isn't life like that sometimes, when you try to buy into what the world calls new? And uh, I don't know, pastor, have you ever bought a new pair of shoes and you're excited about those new pair of shoes and somehow between the store and home, that new pair of shoes gets scuffed up. Maybe you hit the side of a curb the wrong way and that nice shiny shoe is scuffed, right? And it's no longer new anymore. Now I know we can polish and we can buff and we can do everything we can to make that shiny again. 
But it's just so sad, you know, that the world promises newness. And what we find is that the world's newness never lasts very long. Oh, I got good news for you tonight. Because God has a billboard, too. Did you know that? God has a billboard, too. And we're going to drive down the street and take a look at this billboard. So hop in the bus, hop in your car, whatever you want to do, take a walk. We are going to drive down the New Testament. We're going to drive past Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We're going to drive past Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, and somewhere in the middle of 2 Corinthians Street, we are going to look at chapter 5, verse 17. Those wonderful guys in the audio booth are going to get that up on the screen just about now. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. And, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, yes. And what does God's billboard say? Are we having trouble back there? No, we're not. There it is. There's the billboard. That's God's billboard. Therefore, if anyone is in who? Christ. He is kind of a new creation. No, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, some things become new. All things become new. What? That is amazing. God doesn't promise just a newness that lasts five minutes, but he's talking about some kind of newness that permeates your whole entire being. Does that sound good to you? That sounds good to me. That's his guarantee that all things become new. How can this be? Well, I'm thinking of a lady who lived a long time ago. This lady lived somewhere in the first century. And she grew up her whole entire life walking to the same old place. You know, because mommy walked there. And she'd follow mommy to this place hundreds of times and hundreds of times and hundreds of times. And then she grows up and mommy passes away. And she finds herself walking to the same old well, right? Same old well. And this lady's depressed, you know? She's discouraged. Why? Because she's not only tired of the same old well, but she's tired of the same old town. Because everybody in that town knows her. And everybody in that town has labeled her, right? And she's tired of it. She needs newness in her life. You ever feel like that? That people know all about you and they never let it go? Everybody knows the kind of person you are. I'm not saying you're like that kind of person, but you know, people like to label people. And so she had that reputation. The one who was used and abused, who had all kinds of failed relationships. I mean, this lady was laden and heavy, heavily weighed down. And so she goes to the well one day, and there happens to be this man sitting on the edge of the well, and she's going to get her water out of the well, and he turns to her and says, hey, give me a drink. And she has to remind him, because, you know, there's cultural differences here, <laughs> you know, that, hey, guy, you're not supposed to be talking to me, first of all, because you're a man and I'm a woman, right? That's kind of the issues back then. But more importantly than that, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. So why are you talking to me? Well, we can pick up the story right here in, in John chapter 4, verse 10. And this man, of course, we know who this is. It happens to be Jesus, right? And he turns to the lady and he says these words. If we can pull that scripture up right about now. The lady's sitting there wondering, why is this guy talking to me? And Jesus says to her in John chapter 4, verse 10, Turn in your Bibles if we can't get that up on the screen. He says to her, if you only knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him. And he would have given you water from Fiji. No, no. Do they sell Fiji bottled water here? Yeah. Does it even really come from Fiji? I don't know. Whatever. He says that he's going to give her living water, right? I've never seen living water. But anyway, that's what Jesus told her. And she's thinking, what? Living water? What in the world is that? And so, of course, she has to remind him, right? She's got to remind him because, first of all, why is he talking to her in the first place? So she's got to remind him, sir, the well is deep. You know, life's complicated, man. Life is not easy. It's deep. And don't we do that with God sometimes, right? He's trying to give us something. And we just don't think this is possible, right? I mean, I know, Lord, you can do all things. I, I read the word, and I see that you can do all kinds of miracles. But really, I mean, when it comes to my life, my life is complicated, right? My life is deep. My problems run really deep, Lord. I, I mean, do you know how deep this well is, right? This is Jacob's well we're talking about here. And so she goes on and on and on and tries to kind of distract him from, from his question. And what does he say to her? 
he says to her in the next verse, John chapter 14, verse 13. Oh, that's not our next verse. I'm sorry. No, I think we skipped one. That's right, because we are still in John chapter 4. Did you have, ver it's actually John 4, 13. Okay, so anyway, he says to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, right? But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life, right? Wow, that is living water. And what does everlasting life mean in the context of what he's talking about, the water? Everlasting newness, right? You imagine never having to go to the well again? And we know the rest of the story. We're not going to cover the whole story. But she says, sir, give me this water. And so something happens here. Jesus promises to give her never-ending newness. And trust me, this lady is ready for never-ending newness. She's tired of going to the well. She's tired of going to that well. And maybe the well wasn't really that deep. Maybe sometime, someday, she could see her own face in the reflection on that water. And what she sees, she doesn't like. So to hear these words of Jesus stirs something in her. Did you know that Jesus can transform your whole life? and do something new inside that never goes away? That's right. He says that he can make all things new. Jesus can fix your reputation too. Did you know that? Right? I mean, sure, the Lord can, can maybe work things and orchestrate events so that we get a, a new car that's breaking down or maybe you know, find a means to take care of our mortgage and we're a little bit behind on our bills or something like that. But I mean, the reputation, that's a tough one, right? The reputation, that's a tough one. But here's the deal. When Jesus offers you something and you accept what he offers, something happens inside. A newness starts to take place. In fact, it's so new that you can't even contain it. How many of you have ever experienced something that was just so exciting that you had to run and tell somebody? Hmm? I hope so. If not, then we all need newness. <laughs> right? I only saw a few hands. Nevertheless, so guess what happened? She has this experience with Jesus. He tells her all about her past, and she's so excited because this cannot be a normal guy. This must be a prophet. She runs into town and tells everybody about what Jesus did. And then he, she brings them all to meet Jesus, right? Well, guess what happened to her reputation? She was no longer known as the woman who had been with this guy, that guy, this guy, that guy. One failed relationship after another, one problem after another, one bad choice after another. Now she's no longer known as that person but now she's known as the woman who met Jesus. You know, it really doesn't matter what our backgrounds are. It doesn't even really matter what our reputation is. I mean, it matters, but it only matters if we give it to God. Because when we have an encounter with Jesus, we can be so transformed that when people see us, they're not going to remember us as that person who did this or this person who did that. They're going to know us as the one who met Jesus. Why? Because Jesus can make all things new. And that brings us to God's second billboard. And we're going to see that as we drive a little further to the end of the street in Revelation chapter 21, verse 5. What does the Bible say? In fact, this is Jesus because it says, Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I do what? Make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are faithful, are true, and faithful. You see, there's God's guarantee, right? Isn't it nice when you get a product and it comes with a guarantee? I don't know what the deal is with England, but you guys don't have Walmart. But you've heard of Walmart, right? Walmart is known for its return policy, okay? Now, their return policy is so good that you can take the thing out of the package, you can drop it on the floor, break it. I'm not saying I've done this. <laughs> you can break it, you know? You can bring it back missing half the pieces it had when you bought it, and they'll take it without the package. They'll take it without a receipt. And they'll say, here's your cash. Now, maybe that's why they're losing a billion dollars every once in a while. But nevertheless, their return policy is so good that you can take it back, no matter what the condition. Well, guess what? God's return policy is better than that. Because he guarantees that he can make all things new. And brothers and sisters, we need that kind of guarantee in this life. You know what? My, my, my wife and I, we've done a few little walks as we... Um, as we've been here, and I've noticed, my wife has noticed too, and you'll find this in any city, in any part of the world, but the people in London just don't look that happy, okay? Don't take any offense to that, because it's not a reflection of you. You come to Bakersfield, California, where I pastor, and the people aren't gonna look that happy either, you know? Our problem in Bakersfield is obesity, you know? 
We are the, the, we have the highest percentage of obesity in all the counties in California. It's terrible, right? And I told you about the terrible air quality, the worst in North America. But anyway, it's a, it, you walk around and people just don't look happy. And in London, I noticed they just don't look happy also. I think they need some newness. What do you think? They need to hear that Jesus can do something new. Trust me, they're running in the gerbil's wheel every single day. I can't believe how many people smoke on the street. We mentioned that. I mentioned Sabbath morning. I said, you know what? I'm going to have to go back to church and check myself into rehab. Because somehow between the time that I left for London and came back, I probably will have smoked about 10 packs of cigarettes without even picking up, picking up a pack, right? And my church members are going to say, I didn't know you smoked. And I'm going to say, I didn't. Well, at least I haven't for about 23 years until I went to London. They need newness, right? They need God's guarantee that he can create within, within them new desires, the ability to break a habit that's got them chained and in clutches. That's the kind of newness that God pra- uh, promises us. But there's something else we need to know, brothers and sisters, about newness, okay? Yes, the Lord promises us newness. He promised her newness at the well. But did you know there's something about newness that we have a part to play? So let's take a, take a trip, uh, make a little small U-turn, and we're going to go to God's third billboard, and that third billboard is going to be found, that's right, in 2 Corinthians chapter, nope, that's not right, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Uh, brother in the, uh, the AV booth, it's Romans chapter 12, verse 2. This is God's other billboard, and this has a little bit more to do with us than it does to do with what God is offering us. Don't get discouraged. There is a promise even within this verse. So, you turn, going backwards a little bit, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And what does God's third billboard say? And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now, let me ask you a question. What is better, mind renewal or being renewed in your body? Hmm? Now, I know some of you would like to, well, I know I'd like to have a little bit bigger muscles. I'm not weak, trust me. But, you know, I'd like to work out a little bit more. I wish I had more time to do so. I'd like to be a little bit more transformed into a kind of a, you know, stocky, buff pen of a guy, you know? And maybe some of you ladies would like, you know, to, to do some, um, have some transformation too. Not looking at anybody, not making any assumptions. I mean that, <laughs> you know? So, so what would you rather have, though? Would you rather have the perfect body or the perfect mind? Really? Good choice. The perfect mind. Because the truth is there's a lot of people out there who've got the, purple, the perfect body but their mind is full of rotten thoughts. True? But if you've got the perfect mind, you should start caring about your body and making some good decisions along the way, right? When I was in college, there was this, um, a friend of mine, she was a girl, and and me and my guy friends and and a bunch of the other girls, you know, we would hang out and and chat and stuff like that. We tried to set this girl up with uh, one of my buddies. She was a very sweet girl, you know? We said, man, you know, you guys should talk more often. Um, And so we tried, but you know what? She didn't have her eyes set on him. She had her sights set on the other guy who wasn't a part of our group. He wasn't into theology, and not that that makes you good. But, but she had her eyes set on the guy who was in the gym all the time, this big dude who had muscles and everything else. That's who she wanted to be with, right? And we tried and tried, no, 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 no. You know, really, you really ought to get to know him. And ah, no, 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 no. Well, guess what? She actually got together with, with the big guy, right? And she was with him for about maybe two months until she couldn't wait to get out of that relationship. You want to know why? Because the guy had the perfect body, but he didn't have any brains. I mean, he had a brain. He had a brain, but he didn't have a godly brain. And so he didn't treat her like a lady ought to be treated, right? He didn't care about her. All he cared about was himself. That's why he looked in the mirror 95% of his waking hours. True? True. And she realized very quickly on, you know what, it doesn't matter how good the guy looks if he's got, if he doesn't have a heart for the woman. Now, ladies, am I right or am I wrong? Ladies have this, <laughs> what should I say? Knack. You know what knack means? This tendency to go for the guy who looks like they could protect them, right? And I know you've told me, dear, right, that, that when I hug you and I hug you tight and stuff like that, so I love how you hug me tight and I feel protected, right? That's a part of marriage, right? That's a part of healthy affection when you're married. Anyway, so she quickly discovered that it wasn't so much her physical protection that she wanted. 
She wanted to protect her heart, right? She wanted a guy who wasn't going to protect her from the, the weirdos walking down the street. She wanted a guy that was going to protect her heart. So what's better, having your mind transformed or having your body transformed? Your mind, because your mind affects every single thing else that you do. That's right. But the verse also says something very critical. It says, do not be conformed to this world. Am I right? Isn't that what the verse says? So what does that mean? Now, I know in England you have some very pretty dams, um, reservoirs, dams, is that the right word? Have you ever been up to the Elon Valley? I have not. I've looked at the pictures online because I grew up next to a reservoir where there was a really nice dam that I used to do my homework at sometimes. So apparently you've got some very pretty dams in the Elon Valley, and there's also the Derwent Dam, right? And the, uh, what's the other one? I wrote it down here. Uh, the Lynn Brian Dam. I don't know if I'm even saying that right. Just raise your hand if you've taken a ride into the country and seen the dam. Nobody? You're not country folk? You have. Praise the Lord. Did you enjoy the ride? <laughs> okay. I really can't hear what you're saying, but, but your hand signals look good, so I'm going to say she enjoyed the ride. Okay. Praise the Lord. Good. Dams are really good in the physical world, right? They are, because we can stop the flow of a river, and by stopping the flow of a river, that river can be diverted into other little towns to provide water. I mean, this is what beavers do. They, they build a dam, and they actually live inside of it. So in the physical world, dams are really good. The problem is in the spiritual world. See, the truth is God wants to give us the living water, the river of life, not the literal one that one day we're going to drink out of and maybe even swim out of, but he wants to give us the living water. What did Jesus say? That will spring up into everlasting fountains, right? Jesus wants to give us a river in our life that is not going to stop. But sometimes we're so used to the old that we dam up the water of life. You follow me? Think about it this way. How many here like to um, grow, grow tomatoes? Anybody here have like a little green thumb? They like to plant little plants and seeds and grow little plants around their house. You do? Isn't that nice? Uh, my wife loves to. She, we, and when we lived in Illinois, when I worked at 3ABN, we had a fairly big garden. Now, we were always growing all kinds of vegetables. But the tomatoes, for some reason, some years there, there would be good tomatoes, and other years there was bad tomatoes. Well, my wife ran into somebody at 3ABN at the church, and she said, let me give you some pointers. First of all, tomato plants have what they call suckers. You know what a sucker is? Not a person. In, in, in America, that term can refer to a person that just really gets on your nerves. But, but tomato plants have these things called suckers. And basically what the suckers do is they look like a vine that would also have a tomato on it. But what they actually do is they suck the life out of the rest of the vine, the nutrients, so the tomatoes grow very poorly, right? So my wife started plucking off the suckers. And what happened to the tomatoes? Much better tomatoes, right? Yeah. The problem with us sometimes is that we're so used to the suckers. <laughs> we're so used to the suckers. We're so used to living with the suckers, that we don't want to give them up. I'm not even saying we like the suckers. <laughs> but sometimes there's toxicity in our life, toxic relationships, right? Toxic decisions, toxic habits. And we don't even like the habits. But we're so used to the habits that we don't do anything about them. Am I right? We just kind of ignore them while trying to have new life in Jesus. And what happens? We're stopping up the dam, we're stopping up the waters with a dam of bad habits. So the problem is this, the verse is saying, do not be conformed to the world, right? But be transformed. The, the only way that we cannot be conformed to the world is if we're willing to let go of the suckers in our life. If we're willing to let go of the bad habits. Remember, who has the power, who had the power of death? The devil, right? That's right. The devil had the power of death because that's why Jesus came, to destroy him who had the power of death. That is, the devil. Now, even though he is a defeated foe, trust me, the devil is not going to give up. He's going to try to keep putting in your life negative thoughts, toxicity, and, and encourage you to hold on to those old things that are damming up the river that God wants to flow freely in your life. Let me illustrate it this way as we cl get closer to our, our close. I was in college, and I told you I didn't grow up a Christian. I became an Adventist at the age of 21. But I went to college, at Atlantic Union College, at the age of 20. Now, at that point, after about three years of wrestling with God, and not even thinking that God existed, but my mom kept sharing truth with me, eventually started to believe that God existed. I didn't know Jesus yet. 
but I'd seen him do so many amazing things that, that I was interested and I was very curious what God could do. So I was curious in godly things. I met a bunch of Christians my first semester, good Christian men, young guys. They laughed and they never said a curse word. I thought that was the craziest thing in my life. A bunch of guys get together and don't curse? For me, that was amazing. And so I was attracted to that, right? Like, wow, we can have a good time and not curse and do all kinds of bad stuff. So my first semester at college was an amazing time of growth for me, okay? I stopped listening to all the old music that I was listening to. I stopped smoking. I stopped doing all my bad, most of my bad habits, okay? You follow me? What do you think happened second semester? I met a bunch of Christians, okay, who grew up in the church, who went to church, but the church wasn't in them. You know what I'm saying, right? You're in church, but the church isn't in you. And these guys, I was instantly bonded with them. You want to know why? Because even though they were Christians, they were into all the same old junk that I had been into. And because I wasn't really in a living relationship with the Lord yet, I thought, hey, you know what? Maybe I can have both. Maybe there was nothing wrong with my old music. Maybe there really wasn't anything wrong with, well, I kind of knew something was wrong, smoking. But, you know, maybe my old life, really wasn't so much a bad thing. Maybe it just needed to blend with this new interest of mine in God. So, so you know what happened? I decided to roommate with them second semester. My grades went down. They were like A's across the board. Then they went down to D's, right? Then we're sneaking out of the dorm almost every night, getting in trouble, and make a long story short, at, by the end of second semester, I was lying in a bed in Boston, Massachusetts, about 3 o'clock in the morning, thinking about my life and looking back at my life. And I realized that the mess I was in was the mess I created. That I had damned up every good thing God was trying to do in my life, and I rolled off that bed at 3 a.m. in the morning. My friends were all sleeping, passed out around me. And I got on my knees and I said, you know what, Lord? If you can create newness in my life, I am yours. Now, here's how good God is. Because when you call on God in sincerity, and I'm not saying you need to fabricate some amazing poetic prayer. <laughs> Even Jesus said, don't pray like the heathen. Just repeat themselves after one, you know, all the time. He said, don't pray like them. What he's basically saying is, talk to me. And we're going talk to prayer, talk about prayer in the, one of the next coming nights. Talk to me. And that's what I did. I didn't really know how to even address him. I just said, Lord, I even called him Lord. I don't even know why, because he was not Lord of my life. But everybody else called him Lord. And so I said, Lord, if you can do anything with my life, I'm yours. You know what happened? Nothing. Really. I, I made that prayer, and I didn't feel a single thing happen until I went home that summer. I went home that summer, and the first thing that happened was all my old friends bombarded my house. Hey, Kev, you're back home. Let's go party. Da -da 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 -da. Well, the first thing I noticed was I'd, I wasn't interested in partying. It wasn't a conscious decision. I wasn't interested in going to the parties. And so I would stay home. I was also an art major uh, at that time. So I would stay at home, and I'd do some drawing. And then I found that I stopped smoking as much, right? But I realized that I had, to do, I had to do something about the smoking. So I took the pack of cigarettes. I flushed them down the toilet. I got rid of the lighters and every single thing else connected with that. I took off the suckers from my life. You hear me? And I noticed that the more I chose to get rid of the old, new things started to happen. So there was a partnership. Yes, the Lord holds out to us the offer of, of life that never ends, water that never ends. But in the verse in, in Romans, it's also saying, do not be conformed to the world. The world will tell you you can have both, and that's the world that we're living in right now, right? It doesn't matter what religion you're in. You can be a Buddhist. You can be a, uh, a, um, a Hindu. You can be a Christian. You can be um, you name it. You can make up your own religion. You can be a witch. It all doesn't matter. In the end, we're all going to the same place. Live life as you please, correct? Because the world says you can have both. You can have it all. Hey, I'm amazed. You know, I'm almost frustrated when I meet new people uh, in, in, in my hometown because I'm looking for an opportunity to witness to them. I'm, think, I'm hoping that they have never heard the name Jesus before. But most of the time, I find out that they have. And to them, it's really no big deal. Oh, yeah, 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 I'm a Christian. Really? Oh, man. <laughs> you know, you're looking for that opportunity to share the Lord with someone who's never heard it before. Not that they don't need Jesus. But you hear what I'm saying, right? That's the world we live in. Jesus doesn't shock them anymore, the name Jesus. It's nothing new. They hear it all the time. They see it all the time. But I believe that if we were to allow God to do something amazingly new in our lives, create a newness in us, that our lives would be so transformed that they would see that and they would want that. Billboard number six. 
We're going to back down the carriageway and go to our, our final billboard. And it is in Luke chapter 38, 5, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 5, verse 38 and 39. And what does the Bible say? What does Jesus say? He says, but new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. No one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires the new, for he says the old is better. Right? Let's go back. No one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires the new, for he says the old is better. What was I saying? We can be stuck doing the same old things, running in the same old gerbil wheel for so long that we don't even have a taste for the new. But I believe if we met Jesus tonight, if Jesus, if we would just allow the Lord to speak to us through his word, the only word that breathes, that we would hear him saying, stop the craziness. Stop trying to have a new life while clinging to the old. My wife and I went for a walk today. We went for a walk by the River Thames, right? Did I say it right? The River Thames. We went for a short walk, and we were walking along the river, right? And, uh, and I heard this screaming from the other side of the river. So I look across the river, and I, this lady's frantically calling her dog. Okay, what was the dog's name? Scotly. Scotly. I was like, what a cool name. Scotland? I don't know. If I, that's what it sounded like. Scotly, Scotly, Scotly. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm looking at the river, and all of a sudden, there is a dog in almost the middle of the River Thames. And this looked like a brown Labrador retriever. The dog is chasing this little group of ducks, OK? And, and I'm telling you, from the point where we saw the lady screaming, it must, that dog must have traveled about half a mile downstream. She was running along. She'd disappear behind the woods every once in a while. And all of a sudden, she popped back out where we could, we could see her. Scotly, Scotly, you know? <laughs> The dog would not pay a single mind to her, all right? And he'd get this close to the ducks. And as soon as he's coming out of the water, the ducks will, of course, fly away, right? And so we, I thought to myself, all right, now the fun's over. Going to go to his master. No, it jumps right back in the river. Right back in the river after another set of ducks, right? And, and then this, this um, very proper English guy comes walking along, walking his little poodle. And we said, wow, this, this dog, and, and he says, yeah, the dog, she better get involved because the dog gets in the middle of the river, it's going to drown. And that's what we were thinking, right? And so the dog is just going and going and going, and the master's screaming at the dog, come on out. And the dog would not get out of the river. Finally, after chasing all the ducks away, thinking he was going to get just one duck, the dog finally must have gotten bored, or at least probably felt that he was getting a little bit tired. And I thought about that. I thought, here's this dog. <laughs> almost going to kill himself trying to chase newness, right? You know, I mean, he's seen ducks before, but you know, it's the thrill of the chase, OK? He's almost going to get that pack of ducks, and they fly away. So he turns to the next thing. Oh, there's another one. And he tries to go after that one and almost kills himself. Meanwhile, the whole time, the owner is calling the dog from the shore. Come back, Scotty. And I thought about us. <laughs> I thought about us. Is it not true that we chase after ducks in our own lives? The billboards, you know, promises newness. And when that gets old, we jump to the next thing. And then we jump to the next thing. The dog doesn't understand that the owner can give him not only duck, the owner can give him fish, chicken, liver. Yuck, I had liver once when I was a kid. That was disgusting. <laughs> liver, whatever that dog wants, that owner could give that dog every day of the dog's life. <laughs> Are you hearing me? And the dog's about to kill himself in the middle of the river, chasing after ducks he's never even going to catch. <laughs> Meanwhile, the owner can pour a nice, big, heaping bowl of kibbles and bits for that dog for the rest of its remaining life. Do you ever find yourself chasing the ducks, thinking that the next new thing is going to make you just a little more satisfied. When all the while Jesus is calling from the shore, come on, come to me. I can give you newness we actually can experience each and every day of your life. Oh, what a wonderful Savior we serve. He is so good, and he's so patient. I look back at my life, and I only see patience. I see how long the Lord waited for me to call out to him. Lord, I'm tired of the old. 
please do something in my life. I know many of us are here from church. I know many of us even go to this church. But I also know, because I pastor a very large church, that even though we look good and everything looks new on the outside, for the most part, I know by counseling and visiting with people that a large portion of the church needs newness. Or maybe I should say so many of our people, Christians, have accessibility to the water that never runs out. But we still have stuff in the closet we got to let go of. God cannot create the newness in our life until we let go of the past. And isn't that what one of the verses we read the other night? Forget the former things. I am going to do something new. God wants us to forget the former things. And so I want to ask you tonight. If you are tired of running around in that never-ending gerbil wheel, will you please take your decision card? Oh, forgive me, I had a little example up here. Please take your decision card. The ladies, the precious ladies up here have one of those. And just write on there, I want to follow Jesus. I'm making a decision to follow him, okay? I told you before, we're not putting these on the screen so everybody can know what you wrote down. This is between you and the Lord, just like Jesus met the woman at the well in private, okay? He didn't want to embarrass her. We don't want to embarrass you. Just write whatever comes to your heart. I know, because I know that the word of God speaks. I don't speak, but the word of God speaks. I know that tonight as I was saying things, things were coming to your mind. And you know in your heart of hearts that the Holy Spirit was bringing things to your mind, and you know even now the things that reside in your closet. I don't necessarily want to know what those are. All I want you to know is that Jesus knows what those are. And he doesn't care. All he cares about is you accepting the new and him getting rid of the old, if you let him. So if that's your desire tonight, please write, I want to follow Jesus. Maybe you want to study this topic a little bit more. You have that opportunity on the card as well. Maybe you want to talk to the pastor, or myself and the pastor, or the Bible worker. We would love to meet with you and talk a little about maybe some of the issues you're facing in your life. Maybe you have a friend that needs Jesus desperately. Or maybe it's you. And I said both so that when I ask you to come forward and we can have special prayer for you, we can't look at you and say, they've got stuff in their life, all right? So this could be for yourself or for a friend. So if you have a special burden tonight, and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, would you please come forward so we can pray for you or for your loved one? You know, the Lord is calling us. The well is old. And the well won't be there forever. Jesus has already been to the well, and he knows how old it is. And he's asking you, stop going to the same old place. Please, take the water that I offer you, and you'll never have to go there again. Praise the Lord. God bless every one of you. God bless.